and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Draco Studios. Who, is, who has previously been showcased here in the temple through Eldritch Century, now with Dragon, now with um, Itza's Guide to Dragon Bonding, which I'll give you, I'll give you all one guess as to what that's going to be about. <laughs> the one and only Moy Filigrana. Hello, Hi. everybody. How you doing today, man? Or tonight? Uh, well, I'm pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. Not <laughs> as cold as you are, but doing fine. Mm -hmm. So, a tradition around here with newcomers, aside from the drinking, is the humble beginnings, in a sense. With that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, sure. Uh, actually, I uh, my beginning with role-playing games was right at the beginning of my college years. Because I come from a little, little, little small town here in Mexico. So I came to college to a big city called Puebla. And I've never seen or uh, uh, heard about anything about role-playing games. And there, uh, in my college, I found a group of people who actually were the outcasts and nerds of the college. Uh, so I felt like... a a pretty good connection there and they introduced me to Dungeons and Dragons uh, that was uh, 3.5 mm -hmm. and uh, they invite me to a uh, magical magical night playing role-playing games and I absolutely hated it <laughs> because we spent like six hours creating characters and doing math on a uh, sheet of paper and I'm not any any good at math and they insisted that they needed um, a cleric for their party because they mm. didn't have anyone to heal them so they imposed that role in me <laughs> And, uh, yeah, it wasn't a good first session at all. Uh, but uh, I needed some friends, and I was eager for approval in a new town where I know nobody. So I kept uh, going to these uh, sessions, and eventually my cleric died. So I was left with a uh, empty sheet of uh, paper and uh, some pretty nifty books that I've read and I created a cobalt druid that I thoroughly enjoyed. So, yep, that was my first experience as a Dungeons and Dragons or any other uh, RPG player. Yep. So, with that, with that in mind, when it comes to it, when it comes to Itza's guide to dragon bonding, I'm aware that the, that that one of the sub that part of, that part of the title for it is uh, is the miniature series that you guys have, Dragon Bond Endless Sagas. Yeah. But would somebody be able to jump into Itza's guide without playing any of Dragon Bond? Absolutely, yes. Uh, it's a guide to dragon bonding. It's uh, created with the intention to introduce uh, all RPG players into our uh, setting, the dragon bond uh, universe. Mm -hmm. That is very complex and very uh, uh, lore heavy. But uh, we figured out that we needed uh, something to uh, well, to bring other players into our setting to check it out. So what we did is we took 5th uh, uh, edition rules and tweaked them a little bit to create this gateway into our universe. But 
uh, you can also use this as a platform uh, in your own campaigns. So yeah, everyone can join in and use these rules in their campaigns. Yeah. Now, with both Dragonborn and with Itza's Guide, obviously there's a whole lot of emphasis on dragons. Um, for you, what's the appeal with dragons? Uh, for me, the appeal for dragons is, um, personally, I like the idea of uh, crafting uh, items and and potions and all of that with that uh, with uh, dragon materials, right? Uh, so this is something that we integrated into It's a Guide to Dragon Bonded, but not only that, but uh, also you can. Uh, ride dragons, fight with them in aerial dogfights uh, and all of that but the really amazing part and this is where uh, the whole dragon bond setting comes into play is the dragon bonding dragon bonding mechanic mm -hmm. uh, the dragon bonding mechanic is something that uh, is been uh, proved uh, a way to get a dragon into your party uh, without it breaking the balance of it you know like uh, one of your party members can have a dragon as a dragon companion which you he can he or she can use as a playable character or another player in the party can use or the dm can use but it will give a lot of power into the character who's uh, bonded with it but also will boost the entirety of the party so you get boons and uh, uh, just for having a, a companion. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea, it's something that we all feel like uh, uh, games like Dungeons and Dragons should have because it's on the name, right? Yeah. And we all want to play with dragons, but sometimes the dragon can take, can take the spotlight away from the players and that's no fun for anyone. So... Uh, what we came up is this new mechanic where you can grow uh, your dragon along with your party and it will stay part of your party without taking the whole focus of it. Yeah. Yep. So with that in with that in mind since since dragon since um dragon bonding is essentially the mechanic where ev where everything turns. Let's go and let's start with that. Oh. Um, how exactly does dr does dragon bonding work, and how do you have it where a dragon companion isn't going to unbalance things? Uh, okay, so what we're doing is, uh, first of all, uh, you get a shared pool of uh, hit points the, between the uh, dragon and the dragon bonded character. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and if you get hurt, or the dragon gets hurt, those points get deducted from that uh, common pool. And if one of you uh, died, the other does. Uh, so that's... Uh, uh, somebody told us, right, that uh, then they don't see a benefit for the dragon to actually bond or wanting to bond with, um, with your character. But dragon bonding is not a matter of choice in our universe. Mm -hmm. It's something that happens uh, because in our universe, there's no such thing at, uh, as faith or uh, gods. So uh, w whenever a dragon can see a, a character as much more than just another meal or a prey, and the um, character or the hu humanoid can see the dragon as a something more than just a beast, then the bond happens when they recognize each other. So uh, yeah, uh, these can be done in different ways, uh, and they are all stated uh, in this book and and very detailed in upcoming uh, books. But mm -hmm. uh, you can create this uh, bond uh, with a mechanic using. Um, uh, dice rolls, or uh, there's a table with, that you can use to you create this bond just as a, a narrative hook. 
So uh, any way that the car uh, that the players and the GMs wants to use it, they can do so, and uh, they will uh, as they evolve, as they grow, as the party grows, they will get very different benefits. Like um, uh, like I said, uh, shared H poo poo, uh, um, another. Um, magic new magic that we are introducing in it's a guide to dragon bonding with a new magic system called the bala point mm -hmm. and uh also the party will benefit like uh getting boons like uh, flying and getting uh, some dragon parts into their characters and and some things like that yep now with that, with that in mind, I did notice that there are that there's a list of six um, six dragon broods. Would it be fair of me to say that the that the dragon broods are akin to akin to a a um, archetype when it comes to indiv when it comes to dragons? That's right. Uh, in our universe, there's uh, something called uh, Draca or the Red Moon, mm -hmm. where dragons live. They are aliens to Rava, which is the, uh, the the planet. And every 27 years, a portal called the Eye of Cadmus opens there in uh, in in Draca, and the dragons can raid Rava. Uh, looking for uh, um, some prey to, uh, to to well basically to eat mm -hmm. and in that way they absorb bala because they cannot produce bala bala is like the magic of our uh, setting uh, and it's more like the possibility of change so they need bala to perform their magic mm -hmm. so yeah uh, in in draka there are seven ashurmas or like the dragon leaders of our universe. And each of those Ashormas has their own brood. So they have their, uh, uh, their own mindset, their own agenda. So yeah, so th these seven brutes or six brutes, because there's one dragon who, which is uh, a brood of one, he doesn't reproduce, mm -hmm. um, are the archetypes of the dragons on our, on our universe. Yep. Now, taking now taking that into account, uh, since since um Air, since aerial dogfights with dragons was is some is something that's mentioned. Uh, let me get let me get the bad joke out of my system first. Has anyone brought up um? the Panzer Dragoon video games to you when you've been pitching this? No, they haven't. Hmm, uh, that's I, disappointing. Yeah, that's actually the first time that I've heard of that. I would have thought that some that somebody would have brought up would have brought it up to you guys. It seemed it seemed fairly obvious. Really? Uh if only be if only because well Panzer Dragoon is all is has has been all about um all about airborne combat on while riding a dragon so it seemed a, seemed a natural choice nice w what i've heard a lot is the uh dragon bond comparison with uh that infamous uh Rick and Morty episode yeah but i don't like bring i don't like bringing in Rick and Morty into conversation it's low hanging fruit <laughs> yeah yeah, that's the one that it's constant, constantly in our minds. But, but with that with that in mind, um, aerial dogfighting is one of those things that some people have tried to do, but there's been mixed results over the over the years, especially in the last few years. Um, how do you guys plan on ha plan on tackling this, especially when you have to deal with? a combat grid if if you guys are even using that for aerial dogfights uh well actually it's one of the mechanics that we are still uh exploring and still uh under development uh 
uh, I'm not in the development team on on that uh, part on mechanics and all of that. Uh, but I'm very very confident that the 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 editors and the and the well the guys who are uh, actually experts in uh, the math and all the development side of the this book uh, they are going to nail it. Uh, we are working with uh, Brian Soskin and um, Sarah Madsen uh, have worked with. Uh, Wizards of the Coast before, and uh, they have come up with really amazing things uh, uh, in the side of you know, classes, subclasses, new races, and how, how all that works. So uh, they are still working on aerial dogfights, but I'm pretty sure they're they're gonna nail it. Mm -hmm. So, but it sound it sounds like in your from what I'm reading on the Kickstarter page, it sounds like. In your case, it's going to be it's going to be built around maneuvers. That's right. Ah, oh. just saying. It's it sounds like in your in your case, it's going to be built around maneuvers. But moving past that, I do want to go into some of the player options, starting with um, classes. Since in addition to the subclasses, you're adding three new primary classes, and I'd kind of like to go through the three of them and get a feel for what contribution they're going to bring to the table, both figuratively and literally. And I'd like to start with the Dragon Hunter. Okay. Sure. Give me one second. So, yeah. uh, yep, the, the Dragon Hunter is going to be uh, specialized on uh, fighting with, with dragons, right? So uh, they are going to learn maneuvers uh, from the dragons, and they are going to use them against them. There are going to be a lot of, um, you know, a big inspiration for this particular class is uh, Monster Hunter. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, slaying dragons using their skills to uh, make new uh, armor, weapons, uh, some maneuvers uh, learned from uh, the actual dragon. Um, and yeah, that's a pretty fun class to use. Mm -hmm. So next, uh, next on the list would be the Dragon Herald. Uh, dragon Heralds are uh, just... They just love dragons. And they... They use their connection to Vala, to uh, the ma the, this kind of magic uh, existing in our world, to uh, emulate, to imitate draconic runes. Draconic mm -hmm. runes are something uh, that only exists on um, Draca, the Red Moon, and it's a way that the dragons use to try to per perform magic since they're connection to Vala is severed. So, uh, yeah, the Dragon Herald uh, not only admires dragons, but uh, also try to live by the agenda set up by the particular brood that mm -hmm. they are following. Mm -hmm. So, and then the, the last of the three would be the Vala Adept. That's right. Uh, the Vala Adept is uh, a, a big mix between a wizard and a cleric, but they ha they study Vala, this power of uh, of movement, this power of change in the Dragonborn setting. It's mm, like uh, you know, like the Force in Star Wars. This uh, the possibility of change, and there are three aspects uh, of it. Uh, the dream aspect, the will aspect, and um, the oh, I forget the last one. So it's dream, um, will, and oh lord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, these uh, three aspects of 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 Bala um, are the ones that they study and and they specialize on those. 
the power of um, dreaming and creating things out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. The power, of the aspect of um, oh, that's the second one, the cap, which it's the life and and death force, mm -hmm. and nature, and um, the will aspect is like becoming stronger through um, your your will and mm -hmm. and dominating the mind of others yeah now uh, would it be fair of me to say that each of them is going to have or is going to have a few subclasses associated with them that's absolutely right uh, I can and speaking of subclasses there's there's there are three that were highlighted in the Kickstarter page that I'd like to go and do as and the first one of these is the rogue archetype dream spy. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, the rogue spy. It's uh, like it says. It's a rogue which has a strong connection to uh, Fae, the aspect of Bala, uh, which come from dreams. Mm -hmm. So um, the dream spy uses uh, dreams as a means of um, infiltrating. Uh, other, um, well, uh, to to travel as portals. Mm -hmm. uh, so Akina, like a shadow dancer, but using dreams and infiltrating them to uh, assassinate their enemies. So they mm -hmm. are perfect infiltrators. All right, I can I can certainly get that. So the ne the next one that I have on the list is the. <clears throat> um, fighter archetype, the gladiator. Ooh, yeah, I like that one. <laughs> uh, yes, the gladiator is uh, a fighter who specializes in big shows. So it get um, it get boons, and it get uh, a lot of um, extra attacks and all of that. The more um, audience he has, so he is. Uh, like this very charismatic fighter who always entices the crowd to cheer for him and even their own uh, party members so uh, they can empower their their attacks mm -hmm. and the last of the three is the primal path the path of scars for barbarians yes, yes. uh and those are like uh these scarred barbarians use those scars to uh, intimidate others, and they proudly represent the force of nature that creates those scars, uh, and they channel their fury through them. Mm -hmm. So they achieve great feats of, of, of brutality uh, with, their, um, with these um, scars on their bodies. Now, yep. when it comes to the two new the two new magic systems, Vala and Draconic Runes, mm -hmm. um, a problem that I've seen with some with some folks when they put in a when they put in an alternate magic system is that it's still it's still using the um, spells for day formula, so it's not really new. It's just a, it's just um, putting lipstick on a pig. If if you follow me, yep. Uh, so with with that in mind, with with draconic runes and with Vala, are you are you guys taking extra steps to make sure that it's going to feel separate from the traditional magic system? Uh, yeah, actually, we are using uh, uh, in specifically the Vala magic system. We are using something called the uh, Vala pool, uh, which are points that help you uh, boost. The particular um, spells that you are using, uh, yeah, we are stepping a little bit away, not not all the way uh, from uh, spells per day and all of that, and we are trying to create a new mechanic that feels, uh, if not completely separate, but uh, which can be integrated into your current. Um, um, spell system that you use on uh, 5th edition. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Draconic Runes is something that we are still working on, 
but uh, yeah it's uh it's all about uh separate those from the traditional you know the spell weave uh that we all known in 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 classic D D. but um since since draconic runes are a separate kind of magic than uh, bala or traditional spell casting mm -hmm. yep. and truth be told i'm getting i'm likely to prefer that than than the spells per day thing because i've never been a fan of of spells per day even in my earliest days yeah well why said um there's there's a myriad of reasons why and i've gone over it on previous um, episodes of the podcast on this channel, but it comes to, it comes down to a few things. One, um, it's an artifact. It's an artifact of chain of chainmail that it that has been kept around for tradition's sake. Two, it does not do a good enough job of justifying itself within the setting that it's in. That spells per day model, also known as the Vancian model, comes from is born out of the fact that, for one, mages were artillery in chainmail, and two, Gygax and Arneson were big fans of Jack Vance's work, especially the Dying Earth books, where magic was this highly complex form of mathematics. But Dying Earth is a very low magic. I'll sword and sorcery kind of setting. D&D, &D, regardless of what setting you utilize, is not. It is not a case where magic is, is something that's found few and far between in the hidden corners of the world. Not when you can trip on magic items by accident. That's, that's always been my issue with the, with the concept interesting yeah i think it's something that we should explore a little bit more because like you said maybe we tend to see spell casters as as you, as you will put it artillery right so um yeah you're not um like a machine like you cannot you, yeah spell spell slots are basically that no a, a, a chamber for call it there's also the there's also the fact that um, when you give people a limited resource, there's going to be a tendency to be way too conservative with it if, if you don't if you don't address that. I've come to call this the rainy day paradox, or for the or for those who played more video game RPGs, the 99 mega elixirs. You know what if I can't yeah. use one of my 99 mega elixirs? What if I need it for later? Said yeah. while well, I'll go up against the final boss. Of the story, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you refuse to cast the fireball because maybe in the next chamber we will have another uh, evil guy who is more uh, who is worth it. Even though the GM has made it clear that you're up against the bee bag. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's that's the reason why I've had why I've had issues with that kind of thing. And I'm always I'm always in favor of if you're gonna have a if you're going to have a magic system that's u that's unique to a setting, have it reflect the setting that it's in. I would I um I've been re I've been reading through the Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson, and his magic the magic systems that he has in his books. I'd have a hard time visualizing in any other setting. I'd have a hard time visualizing surge binding in any setting but that book series, for example. So what's that uh, book series? Um, the Stormlight Archive. Oh, Stormlight. Okay. And Sanderson, aside from being a madman has a habit of putting in these detailed magic systems in a lot of his books. In Mistborn it was all about bur it was all about ingesting and burning metals. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but one of the, now one of the things I found interesting is that on on one of the stretch goals you had it 
you have it that you guys are going to do integration with alchemy. Uh, of all of the different virtual tabletops that are out there, what made you go with alchemy as the as the one to do integration with? Well, uh, when we first started this campaign, um, we came across with the guys, with the folks at Loot Tavern. Um, they are um, in charge of previous supplements like Heliana's Guide to Monster Hunting. Uh, and they already had a deal with Alchemy. Mm-hmm. So as part of our deal, we integrated Alchemy uh, into our uh, core uh, setting, well, uh, our core offering. So, um, but uh, as we went along in the campaign, um, a lot of backers uh, asked for uh, integration with uh, Roll20. Mm-hmm. So uh, on the past few days, weeks, We've been talking with uh, with Roll Twenty, and we decided to integrate those as well because in the past we haven't uh, actually used any uh, VTT in our campaigns and all of that. But you know, since the pandemic, that um, that scene or uh, really really blew up. So uh, yeah, we decided that it was a good way to. Uh, to get our product mm-hmm. more and more people. And I, I also see in the stretch goals that you're adding a few more subclasses, including the Circle of Change for Druids and the College of Nightmares for Bards. That's right. I'm guessing yeah. th- I'm guessing those are to reflect the the um magic system that you guys have with within the, within um Itza. That's uh that's absolutely correct. That's what what we are doing right now. Uh, they, I think, they are already fleshed out by our uh, development team, but uh, I haven't read them uh, thoroughly. But yeah, those are going to reflect uh, the connection through every aspect of Bala in our universe. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, there. I also saw that you're planning on putting a module called Tyrants of the Cursed Coast, or right. or part one, I should say, of Tyrants of the Coast, Cursed Coast. Mm-hmm. Um, adventures and modules can take many different forms. What sort of what sort of theme is Tyrant of the C- Cursed Coast kind of going with? What's what sort of adventure are you guys trying to shoot for with it? Uh, we are trying to explore um, Valerna, which is the main continent of Prava, our, our, our planet. Uh, so uh, we are trying to face uh, the different uh, aspects of, uh, or the different dangers within our universe. So we are going to uh, meet in this campaign, a lot of uh, the NPCs of our of our lore, mm-hmm. and uh, not only the good guys but also the bad guys. So as you progress uh, or as the party progress, uh, this this campaign, uh, Tyrants of the Core Coast, it's gonna take players from level one to twenty. Mm-hmm. So there are going to be six volumes, and each volume will have its own arc so uh, it will fit the uh, the level of the party and they will face against uh, dragons raiding uh, Valerna but maybe some uh, uh, some of the arcs will take the uh, players into the hollow depths which is like this um, like this kind of underdark from our universe where the daimos or the demon lords exist. Mm. Uh, you will also face against great um, um, the great Ashormas in, in the higher levels. So uh, it's an exploration for all of our lore and all of our uh, setting. Mm-hmm. 
Now, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as the total page count for Itza's guide? Uh, hopefully, uh, we are going to have... Uh, you know, it's very difficult to tell because uh, sometimes we set up, uh, like, uh, we set up Great Dreams of Draka to get uh, 150 pages, and it, en it ended up in 300 uh, pages. So, uh, yeah, that's the goal here, 300 plus pages. All right, and what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, per se, but a ballpark. Uh, yeah, we are ballparking, um, like, February 2024. All right, I can, I can certainly get behind that, and... Not, and... I will be looking forward to seeing how it develops. Oh, thank you. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the particular bit of madness that happens around here. Uh, it's it's always fun to talk uh, with someone who really appreciates the RPG world. And uh, you're not only, uh, as I said, you're not only a content creator, but you are also a big, big player, and and it shows, you know. Uh, yeah. I, I, well, I wouldn't. It'd be it would be a bit contradictory if I if I were to if I if I talked about if I talked about RPGs but never played because then then I would be an influencer and blah, not doing <laughs> that. Exactly. I barely even I barely even use Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> but anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. But heavily encouraged, of mm. course. Uh, yeah, uh, since we are building this whole world, this whole setting, I do have some things that I would like to share with you if you have uh, the time. Since we are, um, we don't want to create this world and leave it just there in mm -hmm. the RPG uh, world. But uh, we are also working in a comic book series, uh, graphic novels that are going to hit Kickstarter on March 2023. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and also the core books of the uh, Dragon Bond setting will hit Kickstarter on October next year, and we are already working on, on those. So, mm -hmm. uh, and big plans for maybe in two, three, maybe three to four years. Uh, television, uh, well, not a television, but an animated series. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we're working on all of that. All right, I, cer I certainly look forward to seeing how that turns out. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>